Creating big battleship guns from single pieces of steel more than 50 feet long and 50 tons in weight was simply not done. That is because it was impossible to eliminate casting flaws and maintain precise tolerances during fabrication. The answer was to build them in pieces using what was called built-up construction. This reduced components to sizes that could be produced on existing machinery and whose quality could be closely controlled. By the way, there was another popular method used by other countries to produce large barrels called wire-wound construction. We're not going to be going into that because it was not used in building U.S. battleship guns. As you can see, built-up construction consists of pieces called jackets, hoops, and locking rings. The method reduces flaws and allows precise control of overall construction as the barrel is assembled. There's another excellent reason for using this method, strength. A built-up gun barrel is much stronger than the best single-forged or monoblock barrel. The reason is compression. First, let's understand that a barrel's ultimate strength is not based upon the pressure it can withstand before cracking or bursting, but what it can withstand before it undergoes plastic deformation. That's the point at which its metal is permanently deformed or stretched and cannot revert to its original state. In the case of the big guns, the goal is to produce one generally capable of withstanding twice the pressure created when firing a shot. The 14-inch guns on Texas were subjected to chamber pressures up to 36,000 pounds per square inch, and they were designed for up to 60,000 psi before they would be damaged. So with an understanding of strength, let's get back to compression. If you take three tubes that are precisely machined to perfectly fit together, their total strength is the total of their individual strengths. In this case, 40,000 pounds per square inch. However, if the inside diameter of an outer tube is reduced so that it's smaller than the tube it fits over, it must be heated so that it expands enough to slide on. As it cools, it will shrink and exert thousands of pounds of compression force on the tube it surrounds. Here's where the magic happens. The force of compression directly adds to the total strength of the layers. So the compression must be overcome before the layers themselves are affected by the pressure. In our example, the barrel's basic ability to withstand 40,000 psi of pressure has now increased to 60,000 pounds. There's another benefit. Compression squeezes the innermost layer enough to reduce its inside diameter, which is the hole in the barrel. The designers and manufacturers used this characteristic by measuring hole diameter before and after hoops were shrunk into place. They could then use the difference to calculate how much compression was being exerted. Let's assemble a 14-inch 45 caliber Mark V barrel. Here are all of the components. The barrel's backbone is tube A1, also called the gun tube. It's a full-length piece that will ultimately have both the powder chamber reamed and bore rifled into it. The jacket, hoops, and locking rings will be heated and assembled onto the tube in a specific order to create a very rigid assembly that can easily withstand the 36,000 pound pressure produced by gunfire. The first component to be mounted is jacket B1. Its design required that it be mounted from the breech end of the tube, so the breech was set breech end up in a shrinkage pit. The shrinkage pit was specifically designed to cool barrels and their components in a very controlled fashion. It was here that hoops and rings heated to between 700 and 900 degrees could be installed, cooled, and shrunk into place. Both the outer surface of the gun tube and the inner surface of the jacket were machined to very precise tolerances to create the proper fit and needed compression once the jacket was shrunk into place. It was also critically important that the gun tube remain cool and not be heated by the hot jacket and succeeding hoops as they were slid on and slowly cooled, so it was filled with water to keep it cool during assembly. Once the outer jacket was positioned, spray rings surrounding the jacket sprayed cooling water onto its surface. Spraying started in the top ring at the breech end and lower ones were sequentially added so that the jacket shrank and grabbed the tube breech first and worked down. This was done to keep the jacket in place and not creep out of position as it cooled. Once cooled, the tube and jacket were removed from the shrinkage pit and inspected for straightness. The inside of the tube was also measured using a star gauge to confirm the jacket's compression. The outer surface of the jacket was then machined to the exact dimensions required for mating with hoop B2, the next component to be added. The barrel was then returned to the shrinkage pit with its muzzle end up. It was refilled with water and the heated B2 fit into place. Again, water coils were used to shrink it beginning at the breech end to lock it in place. Notice how the hoop covered a substantial amount of jacket B2 to create a stiff, overlapping joint. As before, the barrel was removed and the outside of hoop B2 machined to its final diameter. The barrel was placed back in the shrinkage pit breech end up so that hoop C1 could be installed. 
It followed the same process of shrinking beginning at the breech end. You can see by its position that C1 filled the important function of greatly increasing the barrel strength at the powder chamber where firing pressure is the greatest. Once removed from the pit, dimensions and straightness were checked, then it was time for the barrel to go back to the shrinkage pit in a breech down position. The heated C1 locking ring was then installed and shrunk into place so that it firmly locked B1 and B2 together. Next came hoop C2. Instead of fitting onto the gun tube, it slid over and greatly overlapped both B1 and B2. Notice how it reinforced the joint between the inner layers, not only stiffening them, but further increasing the strength of the barrel over the powder chamber. Locking ring D1 followed hoop C2. It slid far down the barrel to lock hoop C2 and jacket B1 together. Notice how the result at this point was a series of interlocking layers and joints that formed an incredibly rigid structure. Hoop B3 was the next one to be installed and it became the primary reinforcement and stiffener for the forward end of the gun tube all the way to the muzzle. You can even see that it has the muzzle bell, which is the flared reinforcement at its forward end. Like previous hoops, it overlapped its mate hoop B2 so that a stiff joint was formed between them. Locking ring C5 was then installed to firmly lock the two hoops together. After measurements and machining, the assembly was put back into the shrinkage pit and the final major piece, hoop C3, was installed and shrunk into place. It fit over the major length of B2 and extended well up the length of B5 to solidly clamp them together at their joint. The last piece to install was locking ring D2 that fastened the last exposed joint formed by C2 and C3. The final result was an exceptionally rigid barrel structure comprised of seven forged and machined castings and four locking rings. At this point, assembly was complete, but the barrel was far from finished. Final checks were made to confirm that it fell within specifications, then heavy machining started. The powder chamber had to be reamed with two slopes cut into its walls that aligned shells as they were rammed and provide a slope that the shell's driving bands seated against. The next step was to ream the bore to its final diameter and engrave its surface with rifling. This was a high precision process that took several passes and days to accomplish. Once completed, both the lands and grooves of the rifling were lapped and polished to a mere smooth finish. Then the completed bore was carefully inspected with a special bore scope for any flaws. Once it passed, barrel fabrication was complete, but it still wasn't ready to be placed into service. It was at this point that the first barrel in a new series had a breech mechanism installed and loaded with a shell and powder bags. It was then placed on a knife edge and balanced to confirm the design center of gravity. This was a very important step since once mounted in its slide in a turret, the goal was for the entire assembly to balance like a teeter-totter on its trunnions, which were the pivots that the barrel elevated on. This greatly reduced the size of the motors required, along with the time and effort needed to elevate the barrel when it was aimed. The process still wasn't complete. It was likely that there would be a tiny curve in the barrel amounting to a few thousandths of an inch over its 52 foot length. Even though it may be within acceptable tolerances, they wanted to use that curve to their advantage. Therefore, the bore and barrel were checked and the amount and direction of any curve was noted. Once determined, it was marked and a keyway cut in the rear of the barrel that positioned the gun's yoke and breech assembly so that the end of the curve pointed up when it was installed in a turret. All barrels have a tiny amount of droop caused by their own weight. Placing the barrel's curve in an upward position helped counteract the droop and bring the barrel closer to perfect alignment. With that, the barrel was finally complete and it was sent to proving grounds where it was test fired to check performance. Once done, the breech assembly and yoke were removed and the barrel returned to the factory for a final inspection and bore polishing. It was then sent either to a shipyard for installation in a turret or placed in storage and held until needed. Firing any gun eventually wears its bore so that it no longer meets accuracy requirements. However, these barrels were far too expensive and difficult to build to simply scrap, so they were sent back to the factory to be rebuilt. To start, the gun tube was reamed out to a very large diameter so that it could accept a liner in which a new powder chamber and rifled bore could be cut. This barrel's tube has been bored out to accept a liner, and it has a couple of very important features. First, a step has been cut immediately forward of the powder chamber area to provide a seat that precisely locates the liner within the tube. Also, both the ream tube and the new liner have a conical design, meaning that their mating surfaces are slightly tapered inward so that they are narrower at the muzzle than at the breech end. This greatly eased the effort required to slide the liner into the barrel. There's another important reason for the liner's conical design. 
Immense pressure created by firing and the movement of the shell through the bore tended to push or extrude the liner out of the muzzle end. Its tapered length reduced that tendency. The outer surface of a new full-length liner was precisely machined to fit inside the dimensions of the bored-out gun tube. In the meantime, the barrel was slowly brought up to a high temperature in a furnace so that it expanded enough to receive its new liner. Once that was accomplished, it was transferred to the shrinkage pit. Before being inserted, the liner was filled with water to keep it from expanding once it was in the barrel. After being set in place, a plug was fastened to the breech end and against the liner's top. Because of the liner's conical design, as the barrel cooled and shrank, it tended to push the liner out, so hydraulic jacks were added to apply force against the plug and hold it in place. Like the process of shrinking hoops, rings surrounding the barrel were used to spray water first at the breech end and then slowly down the barrel. The progressive cooling firmly and permanently locked the liner in place. After a long and slow cool down period, the newly lined barrel was removed from the pit. At this point it was ready for the same finishing process that occurred with newly assembled barrels that included reaming the chamber, boring and rifling the bore, testing and polishing. Once finished, a rebuilt barrel was in every way equal to a newly manufactured one.